for you to guide them through it and and keep the door open of, uh, for communication about it so that as a parent, you always have leverage. The leverage of influence. Yes, I hope yes. You can Absolutely. guide them so that they can make good decisions, not perfect decisions. Mm -hmm. allowing a, a little bit of space for them to make mistakes. Hello, Marriage Matters community. Welcome to the Marriage Matters podcast, a podcast that is always about marriage matters because marriage matters. However, uh, this month we are talking about mothers. My name is Tanya Coleman, and I am here with you today without um, my husband, Glenn Coleman. So it is an all girl podcast this week. Um, I am here with a mentor and friend, Dr. Angela Abney. You know, I um, thought it would be a great idea to invite Dr. Angela on. She is the mother of three daughters. I have two daughters and I am a daughter of a mother of two daughters. So I was like, what greater guest to have on than someone who understands what it's like to raise girls. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have with me a wonderful guest today who I believe will add so much value to um, the conversation today, Dr. Angela Abney. Hi, Dr. Angela. Hello. It's so good to be with you, um, Sister Tanya. I'm, I'm Angela Abney. Um, I have known you guys now for some years, and you two are easily two of my most favorite people in the world. Your beautiful daughters. Um, just consider you to be a part of our family. So thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for being on with me. I am super, super excited. Um, and I just really want to jump into the conversation. So before we get there, I would love for you to tell our community a little bit about yourself. Um, what do you do for work? Um, who are you? Where are you? What's, you know, tell us all of the good stuff about Dr. Angela Abney. <laughs> good stuff. Well, I'll tell you what. For many, many years, I was a stay-at-home mother uh, with, my, with my daughters, um, but I went back to school um, somewhere around their middle school age and um, finished um, a few degrees <laughs> at Texas A&M University. Uh, I work full-time in Spring Independent School District. Um, I teach middle school, seventh grade language arts. Uh, I also work as a higher ed consultant. And uh, I do that work within some of the school districts here in the Houston area, the Austin area, and also with Texas A&M University. I stay busy. However, <laughs> However, the greatest part of my life right now is being a first-time grandmother. I just can't oh, tell you. I'm just so thrilled to pieces with my, my grandson, Jonah. Um, I spend much of my time ordering Amazon and driving down the highway to go see him in Dallas. <laughs> but that's a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> That is awesome. So that work that you are doing in um, education and academia, um, that's huge. That is, you know, some really important work. I've been in education uh, before moving into counseling. So, you know, I've had at that experience and I, I'll tell you this. I did middle school. I was a middle school teacher for one year and I was like, yeah, Jesus, I love them. <laughs> I'm going to go back to high school. I think I like the big <laughs> It does take a special calling um, to, yes. to be in middle school. Um, for me, I just always felt it was a calling um, for me to do that age group. I uh, had just my favorite, my area of niche was seventh grade. I tried sixth grade, too babyish. I tried eighth grade, too much attitude. 
But seventh grade, you know, they're they're kind of volatile. You know, they they vacillate beginning and the end of the year with a lot of puberty. But um, I found that I'm most effective um, marrying ministry with the call to teach in that grade level. And I um, found that I needed that calling. Yeah. Solidified during the pandemic. (laughs) The toughest time. I mean, I've been in education now, even though I I went back to school later, but I I mean, I've been an educator for 30 years. And, um, oh yeah, yeah, you know, and the shock of my life was when I was just kind of checking up on my retirement last year because the pan- pandemic just brought out things at me that I was thinking, it might be time for you to retire. But when they <laughs> told me that I could retire on my birthday, I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Um, I haven't retired yet, but okay. I'm on my way out the door. I must be real about it. But yeah. um I wouldn't trade it, the experience for anything. It's been worth it all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, after 30 years, you've earned that retirement. <laughs> oh, who are you telling? I, you know, I feel it. I do. Um, yeah. The patience that I had in my 20s and 30s, I don't have yeah. that the way mm-hmm. I used to have it. You know what I mean? Uh, because the kids are just different now. And, um, and I'm not using that as an excuse, but I mean, I've seen it change and the temperament is just different. And um, right now, you know, I'm considered, um, you know, I, I have my certification for, uh, I've, been, I've worked, let me just put it like this. I've worked at as, a, as an administrator and I went back to the classroom um, for the last five years because I felt burnout. And I needed to go back to my first love. So I did that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic changed everything. So I had to pull on some of my mothering skills. Um, In in this pandemic, I saw more of those traits Mm -hmm. than even my, my skills that I have been trained to teach with. I've leaned into... Um, my role as a mother and my perspective from um, that angle to help my students get through the pandemic and teaching in the hybrid model really required that because parents needed to be able to touch me you know what I mean yeah absolutely that's awesome so I want to talk more about those mothering skills tell me (laughs) what was it like raising girls what was that like for you your girls are how old now so there's melissa and i let me see if i get their their birth order correct there's okay. melissa mm-hmm. oh, awesome. melissa 33 33 is courtney next mm-hmm. courtney's oh. next she's 30 she's 31 31 and then alexis and she's 30 oh wow I don't know how that happened I mean I know I don't look a day over 20 no I'm kidding when I look at my girls and how grown up they are I'm just astounded you know what what is the most astounding part about it is all of them make more money than me (laughs) And and I am quick to tell them so Mother's Day was very good for me okay yeah. Oh, come on. You give me something to look forward to. <laughs> right. Right. It, it gets better. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what was it like with those three ladies? Those when they were little ladies, what yeah. was it like? I tell you what, what the, the thing was, you know, Alan and I, we had our, we had our kids, you know, pretty young. Um, mm-hmm. I think first time mom, I was 22. And these okay. days, that's considered to be really young. And um, for like three months out of the year, my girls were stair steps. So somewhere at the end of February, they were 30, 31, and 32. 
And so raising yeah. them as stair steps. Um, mm -hmm. I always had a lap baby, a knee baby, and just a hip baby. You know, I always had that, right? For, for the longest time, people thought they were triplets because they looked so much alike. And mm -hmm. I, as a mom, I took my girls with me everywhere. They mm -hmm. went to the salon with me. They went to the wash interior with me. They, they went to the groceries, but I didn't leave my kids mm -hmm. with many people at all. I mean, I can count two, <laughs> two that I allowed to, you know, watch my kids. So having girls for me um, was even greater. I lost mm -hmm. my mom really, really young. I was 28, 28 years oh. old when my, my mother died. And um, the thing about that was that I took care of my mom, moved her in with us for the last three years of her life. So mm -hmm. having my mother there as I mothered the girls being so young was really pivotal for me because uh, I didn't realize how much I was drinking in my mom in those three yeah. years. You know, I felt, I mean, I was my mom's only child. So I felt like I knew, I knew that I needed to absorb as much as I could. And I did. So when my mom passed away, um, the grounding in my girl's life became everything. Wow. So my answer to that was, was keeping them with me and um, really trying to pour into them their whole entire life. Like I was trying to get from my mom that last three years, you know, um, I wanted to gradually pour into my girls their whole life, teaching them life lessons and uh, writing them mommy letters and and I, and I still do that. And um, I write them letters of things that I want to make sure that they, yeah. they got it. You know, like it was a lesson to be taught about makeup. There was a lesson to be taught about puberty. And yeah. um, so for me, what the way I did it was for, I taught it first, right? And then I wanted to emphasize and to make sure that they could always hear my voice. So when I'm no longer here, they have those letters. So that's something that I do for my girls. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So you said that you you did the mommy letters and, and, and you still do the mommy letters so that they have those with them forever. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time, if you can remember that you sat to write one of those letters, what was what was kind of resonating in your heart? I can tell you, it was, um, if I recall correctly, I think it was the first Christmas without my mom. And mm -hmm. I remember feeling like I'm, I'm going to forget mm -hmm. um, what Christmas was like. Wow. So I wanted to capture in that time, it wasn't a long, long letter, or, and it wasn't all three letters. It was like one letter that first time. And I wanted the girls to know and understand one of the most impactful things that my mom did the last holiday we had together. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to write it down because I wanted them to know that my mother was really intentional about me learning to cook the holiday meal. So she wow. sat in the kitchen on a stool and said, I'm not doing anything. You're gonna do it all. And I wanted to write down what the, what the dishes were. I didn't do the recipes at that time, but I didn't wanna forget it because I knew at some point I wanted to teach my girls how to make those dishes. Yes, absolutely. And so um, I did that, you know, when they got old enough to be in the kitchen with me, um, I, I included them on everything that I did. You know, everybody had a job. 
<laughs> um, because my mom only had me. So we would be in the kitchen together growing when be growing up. And I would become overwhelmed. So I really was not a good cook, okay? But I had to learn to cook. Having girls, I had to learn to cook because um, Alan and I didn't have a lot of money because we did have the girls so young and so close together. So we lived that life of, we're gonna make a sacrifice because we chose this life and, and we did that. And so I actually really had to learn to cook because when I first got married, I couldn't cook at all. Like literally, I was a really? like, burger helper, a hamburger helper kind of person, right? And, um, or we ate, we were college students or we went and we ate uh, in the cafeteria on campus. We lived there because, you know, I worked. I worked in one of yeah. the dining halls. So that was easy. <laughs> but, you know, you, you asked me, what was it like? Um, so when I did finally go to work, mm -hmm. I was like, uh, I was I had one year left of college um, mm -hmm. and Alan got a job. And so we had to relocate. So I didn't finish my degree, right? And so having kids, that's the thing that got put on the back burner. So when I decided to go to work, I had to make a decision. Well, what kind of job do you get when, when you have three small ones, right? Because my mom um, was with us, but she was sick. So I went to work at a school, an elementary school, my children's school. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. Wow. Yep. Wow. <laughs> so they, they went to work with me every day. Yeah. And so that was a, a really big time in my life mm -hmm. because it's, it kept me connected to my girls. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Um, oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I remember a time uh, when my girls were younger and I want to say Bethany may have been. 10, 10 or 11. Um, and that puberty thing hit. Right. And I was like, Oh Lord, like I knew what to do, but I had I, my anxiety hit, you know, it's just like, I just want to do a good job. And so I reached, it's a, like uh, the only person I felt I knew I could call who would understand was you. And I think I text you and you made time for me. If I remember correctly, I probably, when we finally got on the phone, I was at that time, I was traveling to um, Pineville, Louisiana, working on my teaching certification. Um, and so we spoke and I was driving back to Lake Charles. So it was like the perfect time to be on the phone. But I just remember you taking the time to listen to me and to give me such just great advice, insight, prayer, and encouragement. It was just like, it lifted this great, it wasn't really a burden, but the anxiety of my baby is growing up and she's becoming a young woman. You know, I need help ma managing and maneuvering this. <laughs> and I need someone who understands why am I crying? <laughs> And because it's such an emotional time, you know, you, you want to make sure that you tell them enough without going too far. You know what I mean? You don't want them to, you don't want to rob them of their innocence, but you want them to understand that it's all part of becoming that woman. And mm -hmm. I didn't have my mom around uh, when I had the talk with my girls. And I just remember um, that I felt overwhelmed like that. And I'm going to tell you, when, you're, when you are parenting, when you are a mother, there's, there's no rule book, right? I mean, it, there's no instructions. Even when you, you know you, and I know your mom, your mom, you have a beautiful mom. And she's done a wonderful job. You're you're a living testament of that. But it, it doesn't matter when it's your child and you're going through it and you feel the uncertainty 
of what that's going to mean because um, when you think about the world that they're growing up up in right now, um, and your girls, even at a time that it was very different than my my daughters, you know, because social media has changed everything. Technology has changed Literally. so much that um, on the tail end of it, my youngest, you know, was getting into uh, those things. But I can tell you that it was very different from my from my other two. So I understand and I understood then that even for the parents, the mothers who are online today and you're raising sons and daughters, um, my background is daughters, but I'm gonna tell you, um, I have mothered other people's sons, yes. you know, just being yeah. in ministry full time. We, we have had so many people um, that I've had the honor of have been somewhat influential in their lives in some regard and you know other other people's daughters yeah. you know and so i've taken um other people's daughters into my home and um helped to rear other people's daughters and it's not to take away from any other mom or dad or anything like that but you know the way that god gives us the mothers and fathers that we need because some of you online you're mothering someone else's child or you're fathering someone else's child or you may be in a blended family you know there's just so many dynamics but absolutely you know that's how god becomes everything to us sister tanya he becomes everything he becomes he, he's a mother to the motherless, a father to the, to the fatherless. How does he do that? Mm -hmm. He uses us as a host Absolutely. to become those very things in people's lives when they need it most. So although I was able to be there for my daughters, I just, I counted a privilege um, to be there for even my students. If I can give you one example, this school year, I had a, a, a late arrival student who began like somewhere around October. And um, she uh, was one of my Latinx students, not that that matters, but it gives context so that you can understand. Mm -hmm. um, she came in with a really rough attitude. I mean, just a chip on her shoulder. Um, I would try to get to know her, um, go over and beyond and nothing that I tried worked with her. And I'm one of those teachers who I really believe in building relationships. And, um, yeah. and that's really important um, to build in um, school climate, classroom climate. And so I try to connect. So with this particular student, this went on for a couple of weeks and I'm just thinking, God, please, please. And listen, this is, this is my secret. I pray about everything. <laughs> I pray about everything, you know, just if, if I can't pray about it, I can't do it. You know, I, I don't even know how to maneuver in life um, without praying about it. So I prayed about it, Sister Tanya. I'm gonna make, just make it really, really short. And so as short as I can. And so this particular student, let's call her Jean. Uh, Jean, one day she was doing her attitude and you know, and I called her over to me, come up to my desk. And I said, can we step out into the hallway for just a moment? And I just wanna talk to you. And um, I talked to her and I said, you know, I said, I've tried everything that I know to um, make you feel welcome in my class, to show you that I care. And please tell me what I can do. Mm -hmm. And a lone tear traveled down mm -hmm. her face yeah. and I knew God had given me an opening. I yeah. said, tell me, tell me, you know, who do you live with? Mm -hmm. And she goes, I live in a girl's home. Mm -hmm. 
group housing. Mm -hmm. And her other teachers are writing her up daily for being out of dress code. Mm -hmm. Well, from there, I went and bought her clothes and shoes and things mm -hmm. that I knew that if she could feel better about herself, being new in a school, that if it were my child, mm -hmm. I would want someone to do that for me. Absolutely. So that's what I did. But guess what? Yeah. I invited one of my daughters in on it and mm -hmm. she bought things for her. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I've shared all of that just because a big part of who I am as a mother, you know, I don't take it off at the door when I go to work or when I'm wherever I am, wherever I'm ministering, wherever I'm, I am this person. And so I encourage, um, I encourage mothers to, to just look beyond just their own and see an opportunity to share God in a different way um, through the spirit of mothering. So yeah, oh, it is mothering I love that oh I love that so much you know Glenn and I talked about that last week in the uh, podcast and we're encouraging women to open their hearts up to mothering other people who you know rather they had lost their mother or they you know had um, a distant relationship with their mother or just different circumstances you know because and we talked about the women that God had put in our lives over the years who have played, you know, in addition to our mothers, we're both so blessed, you know, with our mothers, but there are other women that God has put in our lives at different seasons of our lives to also mother us. You were one of those people that we mentioned. Um, so I think that that's beautiful. My mom, you know, she uh, she's one of those people that, if she sees a need, she sees a mother who, you know, is struggling, you know, sometimes you just run into people in Walmart and you can tell, you know, she's one of those people that will buy them groceries or milk or diapers or what have you. And she always says, you know, she said, I always think about that. I have children. And if my children are ever in need, this is just a seed I'm planting a seed so that if you are away from me and one of you have a need that, you know, someone else will reach back and um, and bless you and help to meet your need. And it's so funny, ironically, when my sister was away in college, she came up, I think she needed gas or something and didn't have the money at the time. And this was before all the, the fancy cell phones and she need, she had a need. And there was a woman in the community that favored her and she just really took care of her while she was away in college, like a grandmother you know so I think that is amazing I think that is beautiful I think that that is um that is a beautiful beautiful I don't even know what I would like to call it but really that that is a, a legacy that your mom is imparting <laughs> into you and your sister and I just I think that um it's so beautiful I saw it in Melissa's life uh, Melissa graduated on a Thursday and moved out of state for the first time in her life, never being away from her parents or family at all, to Minnesota for a job. On that Monday, she and I were on a plane going to Minnesota, and she was the most timid of my three. She was the oldest, but she was always so soft-spoken. And I'm going to tell you, I was so nervous to leave my child all the way mm -hmm. in Minnesota and it was snowing and ice everywhere. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was just so afraid, but wouldn't oh it gosh. be just like God to um, introduce us to a lady while we were doing um, one of the walks at her new job, she worked for 3M. Mm -hmm. And this lady um, invited us to a family dinner that weekend. She goes, oh, just come over to our house. We're, we're having a family dinner. And we're thinking, we don't know her. But I was like, we're going. So we went. And that lady's uh, aunt was there. And she was like 80 something years old or something like that. Really old. Okay, just, let me phrase it. And um, that lady 
um, we called her granny because I didn't, I, to this day, I don't know her name. God rest her soul. She's <laughs> gone on to be with the Lord now. But that night she and I sat and we talked and I told her about how afraid I was as a mom to leave my, my daughter. Well, and yeah. she said, baby, I understand. She said, she's ours now. She said, we're going to take care of her. My goodness. And let me tell you, she's gone out to be with the Lord. I think she passed away maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you know that that family is still in my daughter's life? And my daughter has lived in three other states since then. Wow. She, is, she has lived in three other states. Okay, God. Still connected to her, came to her. Her last graduation when she graduated grad school, because they said that Granny told them that we were now family. They went through two weeks ago to see Melissa in Oklahoma City. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, you know, and I just think about that because it's been 11 years since that time that I met her. It's been 11 years. Wow. And so, I'm sharing all of that part because I see what your mom is mm -hmm. teaching you. Mm -hmm. I have kept other people's children in my home. I have put tires on cars. I've put groceries in refrigerators. I've cleaned houses. I've done some things that I felt like, Lord, did you see me? Did you know? That um, that I that I was doing this because I was always taught that God will He's not unrighteous. The Word says yeah. it, to forget yeah. your work and your labor of love. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So taking Him at His word, and you know, loving on your children and they look at your example and it becomes a legacy to them in their life. And I, and as I look at the women that I've raised along, mm -hmm. I do give Alan some credit. Okay. He, <laughs> we did it together. I do, you know, he's wonderful father to yeah. our daughters. I mean, just couldn't have asked for, a better partnership together as we raise our kids. And, you know, I was thinking about, and I don't know all of the, the um, things that you were going to ask me, but maybe parents want to know, well, what were your foundational scriptures that you guys um, build, built your parenting on? Because my husband came from a broken home. He was raised by a single mom. I came from a dysfunctional home. Um, I had both of my parents, but it was a, a, a very dysfunctional home. Mm -hmm. But we both determined that we wanted to raise our children in a home that we wished we had had. Um, and so we built it on the word. We dedicated our children back to God. And we lived by two scriptures, Psalms 127 and three. It said, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Psalms 127 and three. And understanding mm -hmm. that they were a gift and they were precious. And um, it was an honor to be able to bring them into the earth and to make sure that we protected them the way that they needed to be protected and uh, honoring them as the gift that we felt like they were was really, really important to us. And then we also believed in Proverbs 22 and six, mm -hmm. you know, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, it will not, he will not depart from it. And then I heard long time ago, back when I was in my twenties, one old 
church mother said, and it won't depart from him either. <laughs> you know, he won't depart from it and it won't depart from him. It will keep him no matter yes, what or you. her, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So those so, scriptures. Yes. I was going to ask you, what was your, your, your uh, parenting philosophy? And so it was the word. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, really. And, and truly, you know, I, I asked my girls, as you know, I wanted to know what, what has been your takeaway? What did you learn um, that, because so Tanya, I get asked to speak on mothering a lot. Um, okay. I even was asked to um, add to uh, one of the collegiate textbooks and I did a chapter on mothering and, um, and, and, and I still do writing on it. So, um, so I asked my girls, you know, I'm looking at them and, and I'm, I'm pretty amazed because I'm pretty sure I've made some mistakes. Okay. I haven't been a perfect mother. Um, but even as a mom looking at them now, um, I see some evidence of things that they are emulating. And I'm thinking that that's the part of me that I think is so imperfect, you know, and, uh, <laughs> especially as my youngest daughter is now a mother uh -huh. and uh, I'm getting these whole conversations about now I understand why you told us now that they've all bought homes, right? Now I understand why you made us keep our kitchen clean and our rooms clean and, you know, yes. and, and they understand <laughs> at a different level, right? Because yeah. their money's paying for it now, right? So, <laughs> but I ask, I said, you know, if I had to, give someone a bouquet mm -hmm. of lessons that my mm -hmm. children say that they've learned. Mm -hmm. and, I want to, and I want to share these. So if, if you're listening and you want to jot down a scripture um, to go back and meditate on, I hope that it will inspire you. Um, yeah, because, exactly. yeah, because I'm just going to put a pin in it here. Um, not not being proud, prideful. However, being proud. Yes. Not prideful in a way that, in a braggadocious kind of way, to where I'm stepping outside of humility. But I do want to share um, why I asked my girls. Um, can you tell me? What 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 is some some things that you learned from us that you feel like has helped you to become the person that you are? Um, my my girls will tell you one of the one of the things that Alan and I held fast to was we had one big rule when they got old enough and they were in high school and you know they started having boyfriends. Oh, that's a whole nother, whole nother conversation. We can't have that, that one. Is a question. I'm glad that you're, you're, you're entering this, these waters because that is a question. I'm Let's still in. Okay, so this, this, is, this is it, okay? So we have the whole dating conversation, you know? And Alan is this overprotective dad, you know? Mm -hmm. The whole bring out the shotgun kind of scare tactic kind of, kind of person, right? I go use it, but you know, you just want to play with their head. And so, um, <laughs> but, but this one thing we both agreed on is you can, you can have a boyfriend when they got old enough to have a boyfriend somewhere around the 16, 17 range. You know, it was a lot of, okay, well now it's prom time. And you, do, you don't want them to feel so detached from their peers that they don't know how to handle yeah. um, being in a relationship because it's better for you to guide them than for them to do it. They're going to do it. So it's better for you to guide them through it and, and 
keep the door open of, uh, for communication about it so mm -hmm. that as a parent, you always have leverage, mm -hmm. the leverage mm -hmm. of influence. Yes, Hope yes. To guide them so that they can make good decisions, not perfect decisions. Mm -hmm. Allowing a, a little bit of space for them to make mistakes. Um, like I have one, the middle child, oh, she will choose the guys that I'm just like, why? They, they said, <laughs> no, you know, but then, you know, you start saying no too much, then they, you start making it more attractive to them. Gravitating so, to you, uh, Yes, you know, you saw the episode of the Cosby show. <laughs> you remember Denise bringing home the, the the guy who was just so opinionated, but anyway, <laughs> right. But we learned, we learned, you know, we did learn from the Huxtables, don't, you know. So the rule was you can have a boyfriend, but you can even have a serious boyfriend, but you cannot mm -hmm. get married until you have a degree. Come on. It is. It Listen, marriage is off the table. And yes. the second was, you will not have a baby. I do mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so some people ask me, well, how did you do that? How did you it do was that? A, it was a non-negotiable. It was yeah. a, we kept the line of communication open. And like I said, we're not perfect, but we kept the line of communication open and we kept the expectation high. Yeah. You know, yeah. my mom, my mom did that with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had cousins that were my age, they were having babies, but my mom, it was a it was non-negotiable. You will not. We're not gonna, mm -hmm. I'm not asking you. Mm -hmm. But I had so much respect for my mom that I didn't want to disappoint her. And so my girls um had that much respect from for the life that we were grooming them for and what we were trying to instill in them, that they really had a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. So much so that our oldest daughter, she's getting married in August. Hey, but congrats. thank you. But I'm gonna tell you something. She set the bar high for her sisters because mm -hmm. she told her dad, she says, I will not bring somebody home that is not worthy of you, daddy. She said, if he's not worthy, I'm not bringing him. So, so I will tell you this. Guess when she, my daughter is 33, makes ridiculous money. Make more money than me and her dad put together. Guess when she brought someone home to meet her dad, to meet her dad for the first time. When? Three years ago. Wow. The man she's marrying. It Come wasn't on, that God. she didn't date anybody else. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that, but they weren't worthy. Yeah. So in Ooh. her eyes. So this young man that she's marrying and I, well, I can't, listen, I, I would like to say she's, <laughs> she's just different. She is. Because her sisters didn't do that. <laughs> Let me tell you. I'm the oldest I, child, so I kind of understand. I had one middle child that I had to say, don't you bring that boy back over here anymore. Don't, don't you do it. Then I had one who, the, one of the scariest things as a, as a mom and as a parent, my husband was out of town mm -hmm. and Courtney had broken up with this young man. He seemed nice at first, but I don't know, something about him, I just, it just didn't jive mm -hmm. well with me. And she finally said, no, nah, he's not the one for me. So she broke up with him. Okay. He came to our house. Um, it was like a, a crazy time and it was dark outside. It was like five in the morning. And 
um, she saw him and she was going to tell him to go away because she, she wasn't afraid of him. But he came, he rushed into our house. I had to call the police. Oh my gosh. Well, threaten to call him. I did call mm-hmm. a friend, you know, you know how you do friends. You got friends that are police or whatever. My husband had friends. Yeah. That would, so, you know, and that, cause he really scared me, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I shared that to say, you know, that you, you don't always, get it perfect, Mm -hmm. but if you train them up in the way that they should go, I can say emphatically that all three of my girls have really good godly men in their lives Mm -hmm. who love them like Christ loved the church. And that is the ultimate, right? Because I don't, lay asleep worrying about them because I know they have a a good covering over them. So, so if I, if I impart anything right now about the whole dating thing, it's just, you know, keep the door open and it's better with guidance than with rebellion. So please just guide them through it because if you don't, it's you, you, you really do plant the seed of rebellion in them because you don't want them to go out into the world making silly mistakes that you can't help them control, right? So guide them. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that was huge. You said that when you don't guide them, you plant the seed of rebellion in them. I think a lot of parents think that this child has rebellion in them, you know, rebellion in them and that it's just happening because they're wanting to do the wrong thing or do the opposite of what they've been taught. But what you just said is that when I create relationship with my child, healthy communication and relationship with my child, then, and my child knows what the standards are. They know what the expectations are. We're constantly communicating about them in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving them some liberty so so that they can learn. Glenn and I say, we use bumpers. You know, you get to learn in this lane and we're the bumpers to help you not fall in the, in the alley, (laughs) just like at the bowling alley. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. But when we don't do that, when, when we're not guiding and teaching, then as the parent, I'm missing those opportunities. Or if they are, if I'm so rigid with my rules and they don't have the opportunity to explore and learn different things with my help, they're going to push back most times they're going to push back and they're going to do what it is that they want to do. But because I haven't been open and there's that rigidity there, that's where that seed of rebellion is planted. Absolutely. I remember um, when I, I don't recall which storm it was, but we had a lot of flooding in Houston. It might've been, you know, the one with the big flood and um my youngest daughter boyfriend was is was not from the houston area but he was a student Mm -hmm. and it, it was the the weather was too bad he couldn't get home but we also didn't want him stuck in a dorm area up on the campus or wherever he was living by himself yeah. So what an opportunity for us to get to know him mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. with guidance and supervision, even though she, you know, was adult age, but still it created an environment that everybody felt a level of comfort and, you know, that we were all together getting to know each other. 
And it made it so much easier for my daughter, you know, to number one, see, you know, how he would fit the family dynamic because it was important to her. You know, she did it different than Melissa, right? But it, her way wasn't wrong. Right. Oh, um, right, because she came to us and asked us, right? We didn't just say, oh, what well, does he want to come? No, she came and said, do you think it would be okay? Because he'll be all by himself. And I'm a mama, right? And I and I, I said to Alan, I was like, I want to do it because, you know, I, I care what happens to him. And he goes, well, I do too. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? My parents had done something similar for him. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know? And so what we teach our kids, they get it. Yeah. They do. They get it. And um, I think understanding that, and um, you getting to keep that door open and you having, you have raised beautiful girls. They're going to look for someone that reminds them of their dad. Okay. And, the, and I don't know when I get to hear what, like people do speeches around Mother's Day, you know that, right? But when I get mm -hmm. to hear how my son-in-law see me, okay, okay that uh -huh. is like... Oh my God. Yeah. It's like, I didn't know they saw me that way because mm -hmm. I, I see that they love my daughters, but mm -hmm. just knowing that they see me as mom, for me, it makes me feel like that I have done something right. Yeah. Does that make sense? That I've done so something yeah. right. Yes, that's and what we want. Yeah. So I and I got five five lessons that my girls said that they um that they've learned. Yeah, please. The, share. First, one, the first one is walking by faith and not by sight. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great to hear <laughs> that that they have learned that that is important. <laughs> And because yeah. I live my life by faith and I talk faith and I walk faith and to know that they actually got it. And that was yes. second Corinthians five and seven. And I love what it says in the Amplified. Um, you know, I, I just love that version of it because it's just, for we walk by faith, not by sight, live in our lives in a mm -hmm. manner consistent with confident belief in God. Yeah. To know that they that they apply that in their life is just great. Do you have time? Maybe I'll, I didn't mention that Pastor Angela is also a fire uh, preacher, but I didn't mention that. Go ahead. <laughs> the second thing is trusting God's timing, even when it's easy. I was like, what? I thought, I thought we taught y'all about when it's hard. You know, and one of my daughters pointed out, she's like, no, I needed to learn to trust him when it's easy, because mm -hmm. when it's easy, I can get off and thinking that I did it. And I was like, oh, my God, that, that's good. Right. And so the, um, that foundational scripture uh, was Proverbs three and five. And I, they learned going to training unions, you know, we used to um, be in a reformation where they went to training union and they would learn these scriptures and then uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your, uh, to your own understanding and all that ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. They learn that and they live it. And they're mm. quick to say it. Mm. You know, they're quick to remind mm. me, mm -hmm. even at this season in my life. Mm. Like, how are you going to tell me? 
Norma, <laughs> you know you said. Well, and I'm grateful for that, right? The third thing is God's unmerited favor plus hard work equals mm. success. I love that. Yes. Oh. So oh, listen. Plus. The God's unmerited favor plus hard work equals success. I love so that it. one came from my daughter who everywhere she's gone, she's ended up being the face of the brand. Whether she's at 3M, she became the face of the brand. Like they, they post, literally post her face <laughs> on their, that's not even her job. She's, she, she manages brands. She's, she's not a model. She went to Procter and Gamble. Yeah, that's, you know, she ended up on the, on the aisles in Walmart and CVS in a promotional because during the pandemic, she couldn't hire her influencers and models that she usually, and her boss said, well, Melissa, why don't you model yes. for us? Yes. So, it could be. <laughs> so she ended up, and so now she's posted up all over, and now she's in other countries, right? And so I'm just adding that to say that that was her. That mm -hmm. third one came from her because wow. she says that she sees it everywhere she's gone, everywhere. The fourth thing is, now, this also came from her. Mm -hmm. Tithing and having a cheerful posture for giving time, money, and resources. Mm -hmm. Tithing and having a cheerful posture mm -hmm. for giving. And I can tell you, I don't know all the ins and outs of church behind the scenes, I've never been that involved in it. Okay. Not, not like that. I'm just mm -hmm. on the, I'm more on the ministry, the word side. But mm -hmm. one of the things I do know is that she was one of the biggest tithers um, mm -hmm. all the way through and still continues to be a significant tither. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter how much money she makes. Mm -hmm. She does that off the top. And where did that come from? That us teaching seed time harvest, um, sticking with Genesis 8 and 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and the day and night shall not cease. And mm -hmm. she lives by that. Yeah. And God has just brought so much favor and plenty into our lives, wants for nothing. And the last mm -hmm. one is, Positive thinking and talking confidently and hopefully about the life and goals I want to achieve. Positive thinking and talking confidently and hopefully about the life and goals I want to achieve. And I can send these to you, Sister Tanya, because I have them in a document. But, that would be awesome. Yes, I guess. And I'll just, I'll share it with you. And, I, and that's it. And, you know, those are the five things that we sit around and we talk about, because I'm wondering, how, how is all of this manifesting in your lives? Mm -hmm. So right mm -hmm. now, um, we, we have so much going on in the world, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I sit around what I'm meditating right now, Sister Tanya, is what's going on now with the baby formula. Mm -hmm. And then, and I've been hearing the stories for the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, I think you've given me a burden for that. Mm -hmm. So today, for the first time I got in my car, and I said, well, I'm gonna do this daily and I'm going from place to place and I'm gonna find formula and I'm gonna to start to store it and hopefully be able to give it to people who I know really need it. And it's not that I have 
so much money that I just got money just to, but you know, we believe in seed time harvest. If you sow, yeah, right? So as a mother right now, as a mother, I'm positioned to sow this into another mother's life. That's but guess what? I got a daughter right now mm-hmm. who's going through fertility issues. And I believe that if yeah. I sow, yes, amen. If I do this, yes, and I consider mm. and I say, God, consider the seed. I don't yes. want anything back but my daughter's womb to be blessed. Yes, That's what I want, God. I just want my amen. daughter to be able to bring forth life into the earth. And so mm-hmm. as a mother, that's my passion today. I, I just, I woke up with it on my mind and I was like, Lord, I just can't shake it. So then when I can't shake something like that, I know it's what I'm supposed to do. Just like that student I had. And I just mm-hmm. couldn't be satisfied with the fact that she had a chip on her shoulder. I wanted to show her love. Yes, absolutely. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Got to follow, follow those, those passions and those unctions from the Holy Spirit to, to respond to that, you know, mm-hmm. and we know God's going to bring the mothers your way that need that formula that, that you put away. And, and we're going to be believing that God's bless your daughter's womb so you have a womb not wound womb so, and you will have another baby to love on <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm supposed to have several right because I was an only child and so mm-hmm. it was always a dream for me to have I didn't want like 10 kids or anything like that but I, I knew I wanted several I wanted something like four or five but the Lord blessed me with three and you know I really want to give women hope you know I I was a I was um I had fertility issues Mm -hmm. I did and I was told that I could never carry a baby to term and and at that time doctors really just didn't think that I was going to be able to have a child yeah. But the Lord bless my womb. Yes. And when, as I brought babies into the world, well, the first time I was such a miracle, right? Then the second time, bam, it was so soon. And then <laughs> my husband's grandmother said, it's not broke anymore, Angie. Okay. You're healed now. So, okay. So now I got it. I'm healed. You- you know so I I understand um I've been a, a mother who I've lost a child before and I've I've, I've had s- a full journey so far mm-hmm. up until this point um but I I I am so grateful to God mm-hmm. for blessing me with my children, because at this juncture in my life, um, to me, it feels like my greatest blessing is to have become a mother. It's more than money. Yeah. You could take away everything I have, but if, if I can remain a mom, I, I just think that that would be all I need. Mm-hmm. So. What would you say to that mother who maybe she's struggling in her journey of motherhood right now? You know, it's um, we've gone through a pandemic, you know, still kind of in a pandemic Um, here in southwest Louisiana. You know, as you guys have experienced in Houston, we've had these major storms. Um, and so a lot of people and a lot of our kids are struggling with their mental health. This is also Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Um, 
struggling with their mental health and, you know, teenagers typically do go through adjustment challenges and things like that. But a lot of kids, you know, are struggling with depression and anxiety, social anxiety, all of these different things and um, really not being focus on their studies with school and all of this, you know, and so, of course, that sometimes comes with behavior challenges at home and, you know, things like that. And that sometimes can, can be challenging in your mothering journey to one day wake up and see this child and you're trying to figure out who is this, you know, this isn't the, the child that I've been raising over the past 12, 13, 14, 15 years. What would you say to that mother that is struggling in her relationship with her child and trying to help her child maneuver this, you know, this world wide trauma, I think that we've all experienced. Listen, PTSD is real. And I know, you know, that as a counselor, and I think sometimes we shy away from identifying it in that context, mm-hmm. but we've all been through trauma right now, social trauma, dealing with trauma. this, this yes. pandemic. And, mm-hmm. you know, that is, this is one of the areas that right now that I work um, as a consultant in, in trying to help, um, school districts and schools understand that parents need to know the resources that are out there for for their children to get the mental health support that that they need. Um, My my focus right now is for black and brown children. However, I wanna say to mothers who are struggling right now and Thank God, I, 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 I really, really thank God that um, I got an opportunity to, to be a teacher during this pandemic. As much as I say that's how tough it was, but oftentimes I have found myself um, um, being there to show support to moms and dads too. Uh, because some dads are, are, are raising children on their own as well. Um, it's great when a, when a couple can do it. Um, but if you are a mom, whether you're a single mom or you're a married mom, I would say to you, reach out to your school, to the guidance counselors to see what resources are available. Absolutely. I encourage you to reach out to counselors like Sister Tanya. They have practices. And one of the best things that I did for my daughter, mm-hmm. and, I've, and I've gone all over speaking about this particular subject. I have a daughter who had some learning challenges. Mm-hmm. And she, all the way through school, all the way through high school, from elementary school on, and she had um, really some some academic challenges and I had to advocate for my child. But one of the things I advocated for, not just for the learning aspect of it, but also for the mental challenges Mm -hmm. that she has faced because she, she needed added support, right? Yes. Because when a child feels like they fail, especially when they have two siblings older or another sibling who excels and maybe they struggle, you know, it is up to us. And I always right. felt like it was up to me to advocate for my daughter. So I did. Mm-hmm. And so what has happened and what has come out of that is she was a late bloomer. She came into our own. Um, listen, I'm a reading teacher. So when she struggled with reading, um, I just didn't get it because I read to her. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I read to the other two, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking, I've done it. I did, the, I did the right thing. But she hated it because she struggled, right? Mm-hmm. So. 
at some point, the bulb, light bulb went off, right? And she, she just got it. Mm-hmm. But it was much like, yeah. like we had gotten through middle school, somewhere on the tail end of eighth grade, things finally start clicking for her. But we get through high school. And as much as the rule in the house was, you cannot get married until you have a degree. Her, her dad said, look, one of them just going to have to get a job. Because <laughs> he just did he, he just like, you know, yeah, we're just going to have to just be glad if she gets a good paying job and be consistent and stay on that job until she retires. But by the time she graduated, she had a new mindset Mm. and she wanted to go to college. So, you know, I'm mom. I got in the car with her and we started doing college road trips, trying to go see where she wanted to go. But um, (laughs) so listen, as a mom, check the resources. Absolutely. Google it, go to your counselor at your daughter's or son's school. Let them know that it's okay not to be okay and that counseling is good and healthy for them. Um, yes. Get them involved in extracurricular activities. Um, I did that. Sometimes they quit. Sometimes, like, you know, my youngest child, she was the one that struggled. We tried the saxophone, we tried soccer, we tried this thing and that thing. Um, And she really found herself not playing in the sport, but she became the the team, what do you call it? Trainer, student trainer. And she was good at it. Oh my goodness. So much so that to this day, she's, still has that skill set, even though she's, you know, chose another career path, but it built confidence in her to find something that she was good at. Yes. Right? Yeah. So um, I just encourage you just keep searching out for what that child is good at and build on that, build on it, um, prop them up, give them, you know, encourage them to take risk you know maybe they're not maybe they're not as good at drawing but they love it yeah mm-hmm. you know create an opportunity for them to go take a little art class they offer so much in communities that we just yes. don't tap into and they're cheap mm-hmm. you know you just have to look at community boards and see what's out there that's awesome. that's what i did yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for that. Uh, I just, your, your heart is so pure and it's so beautiful and you sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience is, it's just invaluable. So I really appreciate you taking your time this evening to come on um, to Marriage Matters and talk to us about the gift of motherhood, because it is a gift, you know, it, it has its challenging moments, but it also has its rewarding moments. And I'm so happy to see you living in those rewarding moments. That is so amazing. I just, I love following you and all of the girls on social media and seeing all of the wonderful things that you guys are doing. And Jess, you guys are just, just precious to me and uh, Glenn, and we do consider you guys to be family. So thank thank you you again. I do appreciate you inviting me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so very much. So before we before we go, I want to share with the audience a couple of on since we are an online space, um, a couple of resources that are there. If you're following us on YouTube or Instagram, 
Um, there are a couple of pages on Instagram that I wanted to mention that can probably offer you some supports with managing one, your own self-care, mental health, also managing conversations as we were talking about with your children um, and building relationships. So the first one that I will mention, um, and all their three, all of them are on um, Instagram. One is Parenting Teens with Purpose, Parenting Teens with Purpose. Um, she puts out some great short mini lessons um, about really a lot about communication um, with your children. Um, the other one is Dr. Becky Kennedy um, on IG. And if you look up Dr. Becky Kennedy, that will come up again. She puts out some really great content, um, information really, I think on positive parenting. Um, and then the other one is for girls like you. Um, and that is a, a wealth of information for raising girls, raising daughters, a lot of, um, scripture and biblical based, um, information there. So those would be the three resources. Um, remember, um, you can follow us on Facebook. That's Marriage Matters 0526, as well as Instagram, Marriage Matters 0526, and YouTube, Marriage Matters. Um, you can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor Podcasts. Um, where can we find you on, on social media if you want or anything that you want to share, anything you have coming up that you'd like to share with the people? Um, I don't have uh, anything coming up um, presently. Well, actually, it's something tomorrow, but I'm going to be doing uh, going to a women's conference tomorrow. Uh, but presently, I think the most recent thing I did was last weekend, so I don't have anything upcoming anytime soon yes but i will keep you informed if you'll let them know once i let you know yes absolutely absolutely well again thank you for joining us um and i am tanya coleman joined today by dr angela abney and we are reminding you that your marriage family and mothering and fathering they all matter you they matter yeah so much